to, to format text um, on, on your web pages. <clears throat> and when I say format, I guess I should clarify that remarks a little bit. I'm not talking about like making it a different color or anything like that. I mean, that's the appearance of the text. <clears throat> By formatting, I mean tagging the text to give it some sort of extra meaning so that it's clear that this text is something different than other text on the page. And, you know, the first tags that we went over in class, you know, the H1 tag was like that, right? This wasn't just any um, text. This was meant to be a heading, all right? So it's special text. We're giving it special meaning. And we'll see there's, there's a few other cases of that. I think the one that we talked about last time was block quote, all right, uh, where you can go and do that. Um, there are several other ones, though, that you can use under different circumstances. Oh, we talked about M and strong, right? M meaning emphasis, strong meaning um, um, strongly emphasized. Um, to pull up and we'll go over some of these examples just by looking at examples on other web pages and we will go over some by maybe creating a page of our own. W3 Schools is a really good resource. Um, there are those that quibble with it a bit and say that, you know, um, it talks about some things that, you know, it misses some of the finer points of web development. And I'll agree with that. But as far as a beginner's resource, it's, it's pretty solid. It, it is pretty clear to understand and pretty clear to find. One example they show which, you know, maybe this is one of, the comp one of the time where I see the critic's point, but the address tag. The address is, uh, address tag shows, is, is tag that you can put on to show address information about the person that wrote the article or person that authored the web page, contact information. What I don't like about that is the break tag. Um, Break tags, um, you should uh, avoid it, it uh, pretty much as much as possible. I, I never use break tags. It's, it doesn't add any meaning to the page. It's strictly a stylistic thing. And anything they've done there, they could do better using um, other tags. But address tag you can go and use for that. There is a time tag. And notice how it can be used a couple different ways. It can be used to wrap around the time, if you're referring to it. Or it can be used to assign a um, precise time to just some words. Like, we'll have our meeting next Thursday. Well, I guess it depends on when you read that, when next Thursday is. So you can put, using the date time attribute, you can put um, specifically what you mean by that. Keep in mind, HTML5 is meant not just to provide um, information for current browsers, but the potential to um, do things maybe even beyond what current browser technologies um, say. So therefore, this is a nice little hook. I'm not sure really what browsers do with this, but gives the ability to do that. Remember, the more accurate that you describe what the content of your page means, 
the more nuanced you can make the styling of the page. I could make all times look a certain way. All right, for example. There is a site tag. Find the title of a work with the site tag. Now that seems a little backwards, right? Or not backwards, but that doesn't seem right. But again, that's how it was created. Site tag defines the title of a book. On a block quote, there is actually a site attribute that you can put on. Where you can indicate where something comes from this way. Mark. I have no idea what a mark HTML tag does, but it's in my notes. Oh, it highlights a part of the text. Now keep in mind that these are the default behaviors. By style, you can make them act a different way. So for example, we, go, we can go to try it yourself. This is a neat little aspect of this site where it gives you code, and it shows you how to highlight it. Do not forget to buy Mark Milk today. And without even applying any style rules, it highlights that in yellow. All right? Um, you kind of have choices, and it's all a matter of how you view it. Uh, another way to do it is you could put uh, that in an emphasize tag. Or you can put it in a... Um, strongly emphasized tags if you really needed milk and you didn't want the person to forget it. Once you do that though, and again, I wouldn't agonize like which to use. Gee, would it be better to use strong or emphasize? I don't know. All of these sort of say, all these tags sort of say the same thing, so pick one. But then you can choose to style it in a way that you want. In addition to giving it like a background, we could make um, the font bigger too if we wanted to or use a different font. If it means, if, it, if you're making it bold because you're emphasizing it, then yes, it's better to use M and strong. According to HTML5, the B tag should be used as a last resort when no other tag is appropriate. In other words, why would you make something bold? Maybe because it's a header. Well, H1 through H6 is a better use for that. Are you emphasizing it? Well, you should use the strong for that or the M for that. Is it something that you're considered to be highlighted? Well, you should use the mark tag for that. But if there's something that you want to have bold for none of those reasons, then go and use the bold tag. Same thing with the italics tag. Abbreviation tag. You can go and define an abbreviation and what it means. Now if you notice, as I put my mouse over WHO, I get a little blurb that explains what it is. So this would have been something, um, of course, you know, we, you know we, we had covered it at this point, but this would be something cool for you to do on your web pages, like where you put the word HTML. You could show that as an abbreviation and allow people to mouse over it and see exactly what it is.
One thing that might be helpful in that regard is if you styled it. So if I did something like this. and said every, anything that's an abbreviation, I want to have a background of gray, color of yellow. Got to put that in the style tag. That sort of gives them a tip off that, hey, that's something special about that. Let me put my mouse over it. Oh, okay. There I see that. The thing we're going to learn about this is, is number one, it is, um, how do I want to say this? Um, your job is to sort of describe your page as, describe the content of your page as accurately as possible. So if something's an abbreviation, put it in an abbreviation tag. Your th job then from the style perspective is, in a way, you're teaching your users what stuff on your page is. So for example, by putting that as a different color, that sort of gives a tip off to the person that there's something different about that. And if they hover their mouse on it, they'll see a tip, which indicates it's an abbreviation. You could. Um, that's that's fair. That would be that would be a good usage for it. I think that would, I'm pretty sure that would work. You could, you could try it, but I'm pretty sure that would work. To, to, in other words, put that inside a link tag so that they could click and get to their World Health Organization's page. All right, there are a whole bunch of others, but even I'm finding this boring, so we're not going to spend time uh, on, on all of them. Uh, I'll just mention them. There is a definition tag where you can like put a definition of a word. Maybe we will look at that one. Oh, a definition link, uh, or list rather. You can have a list of a DL, it's similar to like an ordered list or an unordered list, but you can have then a definition term and a definition name, or the actual definition itself. So like you look at that, it makes it formatted that way. Of course, you could style this other ways to have it look different, but that's one thing that you can do. There's sub and superscript. That's often used in like mathematical expressions. If you want to write H2O, you can put the two in a sub tag, and that will drop it down to indicate that that's a subscript. Likewise, if you're doing you know, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, you can put the two in a superscript tag, and that will show that it's an exponent in expression. There's an insert, and there's a delete text. And the purpose of that is if you're writing some sort of document that has revisions and you want people to see the new stuff that you added and also be able to see the old stuff that you added. So let me give you an example. Let's say that.
in this case, they say my favorite color is, and they have, they said it was blue, then they changed their mind later on and said it was red. Sort of a trivial example, but what they do is they wrap blue in the, blue, in the delete tag, which indicates it's deleted. By default, it gets a strike through. And then finally, um, the insert is in red. Or, or I'm sorry, the insert, uh, of, uh, uh, the insert tag wraps around the word red to, and that gets underlined showing that um, that's something new. Why might you use this in a real life case? Okay. Okay. It could show, for example, the price in a delete tag and then, you know, inserted sold out or something like that. Uh, I've seen it used like with revisions to news articles, you know, when they, if there was a typo the first time that, that said that, you know, John Doe won the Olympic race. Oh, wait a minute, it was actually John, John Doe son or something like that. They got the spelling of the name wrong. All right, they could, they could put that in. I've seen it with companies with their policies that are online. In other words, maybe the vacation policy changes, you know. Um, if you simply make the change to it, someone's able to look and say, I don't really understand why it's shown that way, all right? Um, I, I thought we got two weeks vacation, not one week vacation. Well, if you show the fact that it used to be two weeks and it was deleted and it was inserted to be, to be one week, then all right, you say, oh, okay, it used to be two weeks, now it's one week. You could probably do some slick things with JavaScript too where you could show and hide the deleted things if you didn't want to clutter it. So if you weren't interested in the revision history, you could maybe make invisible everything that was deleted and simply show the stuff that um, the current state of the document. All right. Okay. Next thing I want to talk about is a lot more exciting, I think, and that is images, putting images on the web page. You know, the web pages that we've done so far have been all text. All right. And that isn't terribly exciting. All right. Um, how can you obtain images? This, is, as this isn't a trick question. Yeah, one thing you could do is you could go and take them yourself. What's another way that you could obtain images? Let's forget about being students. Let's talk about in the real world if you're making a real website about a sporting goods store that you were planning on opening. You could go out and take pictures of your friends using. What would be another way that you could get? Get permission from a photographer. So you could get permission on a copyrighted photo. You could use what are called stock photos. Stock photos are where uh, photographers will go and they'll just shoot a bunch of that are high quality, uh, but are sort of generic. Like maybe, I stock photo. So I could go in and I could look and say, I want, photograph showing someone skiing. And I could search for it, and it's going to show me all the results. And these are very good, very high quality pictures. Um, if you could imagine you creating a sporting goods store, it might not have, might not be that great of a photographer. And you might not have beautiful scenery to take it at like this. You know, you, you, you don't necessarily want to fly to Vermont or somewhere where um, the slow snow looks so nice. Although, this year, that really hasn't been a problem. We could probably do it here just as well. All right. But what you can do is you can go and you can get a license for these. So, for example, if I wanted to use this image, this cost, depending on what size I would want to use, it would cost 
20, 35, 40, 50, or 55 credits. Now, what is a credit? Credit is roughly $2 a credit, but they give you uh, a break if you, you, you go more expensive, uh, if you buy more. So, for example, it would cost 20 credits for that, that would be for $40 you could download a small version of this and $40, that's a little pricey, right? Yeah, I was going to say, except when you think, well, you know, what would it cost for you to get a photographer, to get a model, to fly to a location <laughs> where the scenery looked like that, and so on. Exactly, exactly. The circumstances would make it. So $40, you know, you look at that and say, oh, that is a little pricey. But do keep in mind that compared with, you know, the fact it's professional quality and the fact that, um, you know, when you consider what it would take to do it yourself if you don't happen to have the equipment or the ability or the circumstances aren't correct, then $40 probably isn't that big a deal. Alright. Now, these are royalty free. And what that means is is you pay like the one shot deal. Right? Um, you uh, you you pay the forty bucks and then you can use it, you could use it on your brochures, you could use it on your website, you could use it wherever you wanted to. Uh, not like let's say if you bought um, you know, if if you were to um, some images you'd license to be a royalty associated with it. So, for example, if you sold 10,000 copies of the book, you would owe a certain amount per copy of the book. That's what it'll be. Now, the Internet has kind of clobbered the stock photography industry, all right? Because in the old days, even you know, before there were websites, there were still brochures and, and catalogs and things like that. And art directors had the same dilemma then. Hey, I'm making a brochure for my sporting goods store. I don't want to fly someone to Vermont to take pictures uh, of skiing. So let's go to a stock photographer. The thing is, is this is a classic case of supply and demand, right? Now we have a lot of people in, in digital uh, single, lens, single lens reflex cameras are relatively inexpensive. You can have some amateurs that take some pretty good pictures. And it might not be their living so they don't care about getting rich about it. They just get a kick out of selling their pictures and maybe making uh, some extra change. All right? So that's really driven the price as far as this down. Now, we, what's better than cheap? Free. <laughs> All right? Does it, uh, there is something called Creative Commons. And what Creative Commons are is a way for someone that creates something. It could be music, it could be video, it could be photography, create any creative work. And to sort of relinquish your copyright under certain circumstances. Right? If you didn't take the picture, then you don't own the copyright for it. Which means Either the person has to let you use it, or you pay for them to use it. That's your choices. If you simply use it without those two things, then, strictly speaking, you're violating copyright law. And I know people are going to say, you know, well, I've seen on this website, yeah, but they're violating copyright law. All right? Now, if I do a search here, let's say I do a search here for scheme. Here's some pictures here, and I'm going to go to advanced search. And way down here, I'm going to pick, I want things licensed with a Creative Commons license. That is where people, more or less in advance, give you permission to use their stuff. Now, typically, people will give you permission to use stuff uh, a lot of times they'll do it if it's like a not for 
a, a commercial venture, so like if you're a nonprofit, all right, or you're just an individual, you're a kid doing a school project, all right, or whatever. But some people give commercial permission to use it, so you can use it in a commercial commercial enterprise. Lastly, you can also people can also give permission to modify, adapt, or build upon it. So if I wanted to take a picture and uh, someone's team had Godzilla to it, that would be taking the original photo and modifying it. Typically, with this Creative Commons licensing, um, the person defines the rules, is allowed to define the rule by which their stuff can be used without Minimally, if they're if they're you know if they are agreeing to this to have their work licensed in this manner, typically for personal or for non-commercial enterprises they do it, but they can also add to allow commercial enterprises. Let's do a search now for skiing pictures that are licensed by a Creative Commons license that I can use commercially. All right. And we look here, and that's not something I'd want on my sports list anymore. It's kind of amusing, but uh, this, I don't know about that one. <laughs> um, what I was doing, you know, that's a reasonably good picture, all right, I would say, that could be used for a sporting goods store. And is it as good as the other one, the one we saw on the stock photo site? Probably not, but what advantage does this have? This advantage, the advantage this has is that I can get it for free, all right? So I could click on this, and it will stay here somewhere. I am free to use this, to share it, copy and redistribute, adapt it. That is, I could add Godzilla in the background of this, provided I had a picture of Godzilla that I only copied. All right, or build upon it. For any purpose, even commercially. Now, here's the rub. I have to give a by the link to this license on my website. So, if I'm using something, using this image for commercial, I would have to give the appropriate credit for this. And if I made a, a derivative picture from it, if I made, if I put Godzilla in it, I'd have to allow other people to go and put um, Midara, or I'm trying to think of all the great Japanese, um, not Japanese, but um, whoever. I would have to give other people the right to. But that's an alternative. So, take it yourself, buy it for someone, Creative Commons. That is sort of like the rule of thumb for like anything uh, that you talk about multimedia-wise, right? If I wanted music on a website, well, I could go and compose my own music if I was I could go and license someone else's music, or I could look for Creative Commons. Okay. So enough about that. Um. Well, uh, again, uh, as far as that goes, um, that is, there's a question raised about how lax um, many recording labels are getting as far as their music being, being shared. That does
doesn't, you know, I can only teach to what the copyright law is. <laughs> All right. In June, they could change their mind and, and force implementation of the copyright law. And, and therefore, that's how I'm going to teach. If, if, some letters, if, if some copyright holders are more lenient than that, that's their business. But I can only teach the copyright law. Now, in an educational context, it's less restrictive. All right? So you could go and don't have to buy a stock photo. You don't have to get something that has a Creative Commons license. But you could go to a website and grab an image, all right, and use it. And uh, I want to say here, and um, um, as long as you give credit. Always good as soon as you put in a starting tag, put in the ending tag. That way you're not going to forget to go back and do it. All right. 
that HTML. That HTML. Save it there. And now I'm going to go and view the page. There is a way to resize that. to go into some software and resize 
stabilize the image and save it away somewhere. Why? Because you can make an image smaller and you're not really going to make it lose quality. It's still going to be as sharp as ever. It's just going to be smaller. If you take a small image, though, and make it bigger, you lose quality and you lose clarity of the image. So you're going to compress things than it is to make a small image big. So I'm going to make, I'm going to go into my editor and change this, but if I happen to get it wrong and I want to go back and redo it at a different size, I'm not going to want to resize edited version, I want to go back and make another copy of the original. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to edit, or I'm going to open with paint, and resize. I'll have it a width of 250 pixels. Actually, I'll do it by percent. 25 percent. 25 percent. All right. Save it. I can get rid of the style rule. And if I view it again, you know, approximately the same, a little bit. So what I would typically do is if I did not want people resizing my images, I would size it to the size I want it to be on my page. There's a whole different slant to this when we get to talking about mobile devices, by the way. Because mobile devices, you may want it to take up 100% of the screen or 50% of the screen, and that might be a different size depending on the device. But in general, the best bet is go and um, physically resize it. Now if we look, the size of that image, which used to be approximately 200,000 bytes, is now 27. So we made it smaller by close to a factor of 10. we had a lot of images on the page, that would add up. I could download eight images, roughly, in the speed that it would have taken me to download the original one. We'll talk more about this next time, but that's the basic.